Oh, yes, there we are. Uh, now, uh, good morning. I welcome everyone to the Justice Committee's 21st meeting, 2014. Can I ask everyone to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices, because, and even if they're switched to silent and interfere with broadcasting. Uh, no apologies have been received. I move on to item one, women offenders. It's this evidence session uh, on progress with implementing the Commission on Women Offenders' recommendations. And I welcome to the meeting Ken McCaskill, Cabinet Secretary for Justice, Colin McConnell, Chief Executive of the Scottish Prison Service, and Andrew Bruce, Deputy Director of Community Justice Division at the Scottish Government. Is this your first visit, Mr Bruce? Your second. You obviously were very quiet last time. I think I was. We'll try to change that now. Um, I can understand, Cabinet Secretary, you'd like to make some opening remarks uh, before we move on to questions. Please, feel free. Thank you, Convener. I welcome this opportunity to reflect on progress that has been made since the Commission on Women Offenders reported in 2012. We made it a manifesto commitment to implement an independent commission on how to improve outcomes for women throughout the criminal justice system and have taken up the challenge to put its aims and recommendations into practice. And one of the core issues for the commission was the condition of Cornton Vale Prison. Uh, the increasing prison population had stretched the resources of the female prison estate to extremes. I called upon the SPS to prepare to plans in response to, to the Commission's recommendations. The SPS conducted a public consultation to examine the appropriate options uh, while still being mindful of the need to deliver improvements in a timely and cost-effective way. And I've accepted the plans that the SPS have prepared, and it's, this is clearly the best way forward for Scotland's prison service to respond to the Commission's aims, and it's important to recognise that the Commission's recommendations for the prison service were not just about reducing the size of the female prison population. The SPS plans will deliver a new national facility for women prisoners, including all the positive attributes the Commission advised. And it will also provide for facilities in the north, west and east of Scotland to allow short-term and remand prisoners to be located closer to their families. In the meantime, the SPS has also made significant investments and improvements to Corton Vale. The current female prison population is 440, down from its highest levels in 2012. So the overall design capacity of 450 is justified, not just to manage the female population in the short and medium term, but to ensure that in the future we'll be placing female prisoners in facilities that will be able to meet their needs and aid their rehabilitation. However, this does not change our determination to reduce the female prison population over time. For the majority of women offenders, community sentences will provide a robust means to ensure that they're made to pay back to their community for their offending. And I agree with the Commission's aims to build up community-based services that are in tune with the needs of women. We've allocated £3 million over 2013 to 15 to support the development of new and improved community justice services that reflect this. And we've now given funding to 16 projects of various sizes, supporting the plans of local justice partners. In larger cities, we've supported the development of centralised projects in the style of the Commission's Justice Centre. In smaller towns and rural areas, we've supported other projects which reflect the Commission's principles of coordinated, multi-agency working which are proactive in engaging women and understand their concerns. For example, where one centre would struggle to reach all the women across a region, a number of new projects are delivering outreach services which will work from several locations and take their services and support out to women in their local communities. In addition to projects we've directly supported, we've been encouraging coordination between other local projects and services which are developing to respond to the needs of women who offend. <clears throat> the Shine Mentoring Service for Women Offenders is now well established and delivering practical one-to-one -one support for hundreds of women, whether leaving prison, on remand or at risk of offending. The £2.7 million funding for Shine in 2012-15 has now been extended up to 2017 following the recent extension of the Reducing Reoffending Change Fund. As I wrote in the Government's formal response to the Commission, I expected that it would take hard work and time to effect the improvements proposed by the Commission, and this is proving to be the case. I trust that the Commission uh, Committee will recognise the substantial steps that have been so far made to implement the Commission's recommendations, uh, but our work on this issue is far from complete, and we're ready to keep working on the challenges still to come. Thank you, Cabinet <coughs> Secretary. Questions? I'll take Alison first, please. Thank you very much, Convener, and can I thank the committee for um, responding to my suggestion that we, we do take the opportunity at this stage to take stock 
of um, what's happening in the women's prison estate ahead of what's going to be a very significant um, investment, and, and I'm grateful to the committee for finding time um, for us to do that. Um, the Angelini report made two very distinct uh, recommendations. Recommendation 25 said Conton Vale is replaced with a smaller specialist prison for those women offenders serving a statutory defined long-term sentence and those who present a significant risk to the public. And recommendation 27, most women prisoners on remand or serving short-term sentences are held in local prisons to improve liaison with local communities and reintegration once their sentence is complete. Can I ask the Justice Secretary to explain um, in some more detail why he has departed from, from that suggested model? Uh, well, we've not. Uh, what we have is a national centre that will be at HM Prison Inverclyde. Uh, we will also have local facilities there for the uh, women from the west of Scotland. And equally, we've ensured that in Edinburgh, for the east, there is the facilities that were referred to as the local ones, and indeed in HM Prison Grampian for the north. Uh, so the numbers are uh, comparable and the uh, same. Uh, and as I say, we have delivered the national facility that is necessary to replace Cornton Vale, but to ensure the provision of local services for the West, East and North, which I think meets the geographical requirements in Scotland. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, um, we had press reports in 2013 um, that the cost of the new prison would be around £60 million. What is the current estimate for that now? Um, <coughs> The actual uh, projected cost for Inverclyde is 75 million. Um, I'm not aware of the, the 60 million in, in a sense that the 75 million for us has always been the, uh, the funded envelope. That's fine. Um, can we turn to the actual design of, of the prison then? Um, how, well, perhaps not take a step back. Can I ask Mr McConnell how many um, currently in the prison estate across the whole of Scotland in the women's prison estate fall into the category of serving a, a long-term sentence and, and those who present a significant risk to the public? Uh, in, in terms of women, I'm afraid I don't have that information at my fingertips. Uh, I did check this morning. There are 442 uh, women in our, our custody. Regrettably, I didn't ask how that was, how that was broken down. In terms of presenting a significant risk, again, I think that's a very particular issue and I, I would, I'd rather do some research uh, on that. Please, before the next but session. Very happy, very helpful. happy to do that. <clears throat> is the design of the prison um, set up in such a way that these are distinct, separate kind of units then, so that you would have... I mean, the Justice Secretary has said you haven't departed from the recommendations, that you're going to have a local prison in Inverclyde and you're also going to have this national uh, specialist prison. Are these separate units completely? The design of Inverclyde, in a sense, is to ensure that the arrangements, all the facilities that we provide, all the services that we can uh, provide, not just within the prison, but from the community in terms of inreach as well, uh, can have the maximum impact on all the women. And I think there are some dangers in, if I may say so, in terms of answering your question uh, directly, I think there are some dangers in trying to segment uh, women uh, in our care in, in that way, in that... Uh, women who have committed offences that one could perhaps make a judgment and say, well, that presents a more risk to the public than perhaps another sentence is not any measure necessarily of the amount of service or support that that individual might require. Um, so the design of Inverclyde is to make the environment as amenable as it possibly can be to all the various uh, demands and requirements of the whole of the population who are going to reside there for a period of time. Okay. Um, in terms of whether or not we're, we're building to projections, the Howard League, in their response to us, have said um, that they're particularly concerned um, that prison forecasts are at the risk of triggering a self-fulfilling prophecy um, and, that, and that we get locked into that pattern of dealing with offenders in that way. How do you respond to that concern? I mean, I, I, think, I think those are uh, legitimate concerns. And whether, you, you know, whether we work in the prison service or, or whether we're out there in the community, we should be concerned that we have a custodial uh, facility, a custodial service in Scotland that is big enough and robust enough uh, to respond to the needs of the courts, um, but not so big 
um, that it is unwieldy or unnecessarily costly. In terms of what we are uh, proposing and therefore what's being provided, my judgment, uh, for that matter, having been in the business for, for 30 years, is that the size and shape of the custodial provision in Scotland is about right. Uh, some, of our, um, some of our stock is, is aged and we would like to see that replaced, but in appropriate time. But in terms of uh, the question facing us here today, in terms of the, the uh, women's provision, if you take it that we've 442 women in custody today and our proposed capacity is 450 with a contingency uh, of 50 beyond that but not in general operation one might conclude that our proposal is absolutely on a scale basis about right for what we are currently managing now like many others I would might sound odd as chief executive of the prison service but I'd like to see fewer people uh, in custody and more people in the community. I think that's a journey we're on, but we've got to be careful and make sure that the custodial provision is big enough and sustainable enough to service our courts to make sure that the communities are, are able to be kept safe. If I might, of yeah. Um, I mean, the, the interrelationship between community disposals and the appropriate um, resources there with the prison um, are, are, are great. I mean, there are, there are so many interlinks between it, and yet the resources that are being shared out are not very equal. So we're talking about <coughs> 75 million for, for the prison, and, and I mean, I'm most grateful that we're building a new prison. The Cabinet Secretary knows that. Um, but we've only given 3 million this year and, and the following year to building up the kind of community disposal. And we can maybe come to that in a moment, but I'd like to finish a bit more about the design of the prison. Um, I know that you took some soundings and, and looked at international best practice on, on, on the design of the prison, but can you point to anything that you've brought to the design that comes from that experience? As, as, uh, as you know, we not only looked at uh, international uh, exemplars, but we entered into an extensive uh, period of uh, public and professional consultation. Uh, and we've, we've drawn all of that together to inform the design uh, at uh, Inverclyde and, of course, also the regional unit at, uh, at Edinburgh as it's, as it's designed. And I think what we uh, have recognised and therefore what the future holds for us is space that is vibrant and interactive and space that can be used both privately where that's appropriate but also uh, spaces and opportunities to bring women together who have common and particular uh, needs. But we also want the, um, the space at Inverclyde and, and at Edinburgh to be available to the community, not just in terms of the community coming in, but to be a shared space where all the service providers can come together to make sure that that's, there's that integrated and seamless uh, delivery for the women, many of whom have tremendously complex and uh, disturbed pasts. And I think that's, that's something which I think the design of Inverclyde and the regional unit will certainly provide facilities uh, for communities and service providers to come together. Can I stop I, I, I'll let you back in, but I think yeah. I've got a big queue now. No, no, so I'll let others in. I've got Margaret, then Sandra, then Elaine, then John Finney, then John Pentland. Margaret. Uh, good morning and uh, thank you for that opening statement. Uh, could I ask what the current thinking of the Scottish Government is on the Commission's recommendation that there would be an urgent review of the provision and resourcing of services for women with borderline personality disorders and post-traumatic uh, stress disorder, given the very high level of mental health issues they are? That, that work is ongoing. We're keeping it under uh, review. Uh, we're building upon work that has been done. It's very complex. It challenges those who uh, work in psychiatry, never mind those who have to deal with it from a prison perspective. Uh, so it's something that we're trying to see where medical science gets to, but build upon the best practice that we have. But I don't know if Andy wants to add anything in addition. Yeah, I mean, one of the key things we're doing there is our colleagues in the Mental Health Division have funded NHS Lothian to do some tests of the sorts of treatments that are likely to be effective in that way. And we think, I think we're halfway through a kind of two-year programme of, of research that going on there. So it's very much at the research stage and not really at a stage Well, there's some action work. research going on, so I think they're, mm -hmm. they're testing out with practitioners yeah. as well. Um, but the, 
I think when we had the recommendation, that was the, the first step before looking at what we might do beyond that. I think the chief executive was just to just, just on just that. Although I'm happy for you to chair cabinet session, but I like a wee job occasionally. <laughs> my my apologies, Kavina. Um, <laughs> again, I, th I think a, a really important question, and uh, you know, in terms of the service provision uh, within the custodial uh, aspect of criminal justice, it would be useful, I think, for the committee to know that I recently uh, visited and spent some time in the Orchard Clinic. Um, and speaking to the staff and the forensic psychiatrists uh, there too about this very issue. Uh, and I'm pleased to be able to report that I've recently corresponded with um, uh, John Crichton, who's one of the consultant forensic psychiatrists there, about how they can help us to develop not only the service provision that Andy's talking about, but how we can better inform the training and development of our staff as they become more sensitised and aware of the presenting issues. So I think there's a number of strands moving forward, but I'm able to assure the committee at a practical delivery level, we're actively engaged with the forensic psychiatry community, particularly through the Orchard Clinic. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose that leads me on to other underlying causes, you know, of maybe some of the addictions, the sexual abuse leading to mental health. You know, just exactly what's going on now when we're looking at this bigger picture sometime in the future given we've talked about these issues for decades now we've had you know various reports all saying the same thing that we want to deal with these problems can we have some assurance that we're actually working with the prison population now and making some progress in this respect well, uh, we, we are obviously seeking to work there. I think, I think you're, uh, some of the, uh, I think what you're alluding to is probably beyond the skills and resources that the Scottish Prison Service would normally recruit. That's part of why we have academic research, why we have a national health service to look at that. The prison uh, service comes from a particular perspective. It's for them to ensure that you know the best possible information is made available. But in terms of finding a solution, in terms of people who may have suffered deep trauma, I think that's something that goes quite a lot wider and deeper than simply the prison population. But I don't know whether uh, Colin or Andy wish to add any more. I can certainly comment, Kavira. Again, uh, yeah, I welcome uh, the question, and particularly in relation uh, to women who offend and end up in our care. Uh, it's one of the most, uh, I, I, I think, difficult challenges uh, that we face. And not just to rehearse some of the answer I've already given, I think we really do recognise that in that space of custody, it's not just what we bring to it and our staff bring to it, but it's working with other <coughs> colleagues in the justice system, in the health system, uh, in the community uh, social support, uh, for, for community social support and those arrangements, that we need to work in a more integrated, joined up way to ensure that there's a, a seamless package of service delivery to women who've clearly, uh, in a number of cases, had very, very traumatic experiences. Um, I suppose we're really looking about resources because some of this is coming out with the, the core uh, prison staff and their ability to deliver um, advice on sexual abuse. I know there have been some pilots in, in Conton Vale um, dealing with this with some success. Is that ongoing just now? Because I'd hate to think that you know, everything was in limbo and that we were focusing sometime in the future and really uh, um, missing an opportunity to work with the existing prison population, female population? Uh, yes, and, and again, I can give, I can give the, the committee absolute assurance that you know, the, these, these are not issues that we simply understand in the ether. These, these are issues that we are grappling with now, today, and in terms of the emerging strategy for, uh, for women uh, in the Scottish Prison Service, all of those issues uh, that you've mentioned are actively being addressed through the new strategy and we will see increasingly over the months and years to come a more holistic approach to the care of women in custody. And is that happening now? Some yes, of it is. It is yeah. Could I ask about the progress um, in relation to establishing a pilot for a problem-solving criminal court? Before you get to that, yeah. um, sorry, just as a follow-up, because the NHS took over health delivery within the S prison service. What impact has had that on the prisoners? I mean, what, have you had an audit to see how it's much better now, whatever? Because I know when it first came in, there was a wee bit of unhappiness uh, from the prison service that the, as it were, outsiders were coming in. So how has that worked in practical terms to improve the health, both physical and mental? 
I, th I think you're right, convener. I think in the early stages, like, like any big transition, there were difficulties. But I think looking back uh, two years on, two and a half years on uh, now, I think we would undoubtedly regard it, and I think our NHS colleagues would regard it as a success. Um, there's no doubt about it that, that health care delivery should rest um, as a responsibility of those who are trained and qualified and organised to deliver it. And certainly as Chief Executive of the Scottish Prison Service, I, I would undoubtedly endorse uh, the approach that the NS NHS generally is taking to delivery of health care in a uh, custodial setting. Uh, undoubtedly, it, it would be difficult to identify a single way of health care delivery in every single prison. But in some ways, that's an advantage, because I think the health boards are delivering services in a way that makes sense for that particular location. So is it better? I think it probably is. What I was getting at is the continuity from when someone's discharged and comes out of prison. One would have thought that that would have assisted. And one of the things we heard, certainly for the young offenders, I think Alice and I heard, was they didn't have a GP, they didn't have any. So they came out of prison where there was health care, and then they just went back into their health, physical and mental deteriorating. Has that assisted in the continuity in making, as it were, somebody said, the prison walls porous, as it were? It has. Um, it, again, it would be wrong of me to, um, to say that in every single case it works. Uh, I, I think that, you know, in every single case it doesn't. But I think in the vast majority of cases, um, the shift to the NHS has been very positive and I think is an ongoing and improving situation. Oh, we'd maybe follow that one up. Um, yes. Is there a measure of outcome? Because it seems to me then you, you can come here this morning and, and sound very positive, but without any actual contract um, data that you know there has been improvement, even a fall in, in reoffending or, or a reduction in the, the, the criminal um, population, then it's very difficult to say if it has been successful. And would you tend to, to monitor the outcome? Yeah, and uh, I, again, um, I can give you my, my views as, as running the prison service and what I see and experience on a day-to-day -day basis in the operation of prisons and the relationship with our key partners, the NHS being, being a key partner. My view is very clearly that things have improved and are continue to, improving, and continue to improve. What I will say, though, is in terms of measures and evidence of that, you know, I, th I think we... Um, have perhaps in the past not been able to produce evidence because we've been really focused on input measures and processes. And part of the journey that we're on now is to recognise that what we need to develop are outcome measures and storytelling and effectively telling the story of life improvement. That's a journey that we're on, not just as a service, but in partnership with our delivery partners. Well, hopefully um, the establishment of a pilot for a problem-solving criminal court might help. Yes, well, at the end of 2013, officials entered into discussions with both sheriff principals uh, and indeed with uh, CGAs. Uh, those discussions are ongoing. We've drilled down. They're continuing to be uh, dealt with locally and uh, uh, obviously partners required to engage there and we'll be able to give uh, greater detail at the end of the year. But uh, uh, we're heartened at the uh, willingness and then we're leaving it, as I say, to the discussions ongoing at a local level. You would hope to establish this pilot. We've got a, a kind of front runner, and we're working to develop that proposal. Um, it's probably not politic to say exactly what, where that is just now, but certainly I'd expect them to be taking their sort of cases early in 2015. That's very helpful. And that will look at things like the, the full history of the, um, of the convicted person being in front of them and able to make the best disposal. And Cabinet Secretary, are you confident now that if it's um, a community service or um, type disposal, that they are fit for purpose for female offenders? That's been a problem in the past. Well, there's two aspects there. Yes, I'm confident that the community payback scheme is taking on board the specific requirements of uh, female offenders, and I'm uh, sure that that will be specifically factored in, in the local area. Some of the aspects that you referred to are obviously more for local partners in terms of delivery for the Scottish Court Service, for the particular sheriffs who will be presiding, and for the sheriff principals. But we're engaging with them. There's a great deal of positivity. It's being pursued, as I say, with willing volunteers rather than reluctant conscripts, and it's about making sure, I think the point you're alluding to, 
to. It's not simply about what we do as administration. It's also what has to be dealt with locally through agencies that are local government, through the health service, and indeed those in the court service. So, as I say, as Andy has said, uh, these discussions are ongoing. Uh, they're ongoing not just uh, vertically but horizontally in the community, and we are, you know, I think more than satisfied that what is necessary will be there for those who uh, step forward. Okay, thank you very much, <coughs> Margaret. Sandra, followed by Lee. Sandra. Uh, thank you very much, convener, and, and uh, good morning, everyone. Margaret touched on some of the, the issues I, I was going to raise, but I, I'm very interested in basically the CG you know, justice centres and the work that they are doing at the moment. And I think Colin touched on the whole system approach, which uh, obviously I think we all believe that that is the best way forward. I just wanted to, you know, pick up on what the cabinet secretary had said also about mentoring services, and uh, I think it was uh, 80 million pounds from 2012 to. 2017 and I just wanted to ask uh, the Commission's vision in the area of mentoring was that volunteers would be used as well as professionals also and they would be used from people, women in bail, uh, women getting out of custody and I just wondered for an update on that particular issue in regards to the mentoring and whether yourselves feel that you are actually doing what the Commission has said, their vision for the mentoring service. So the main national mentoring programme for women is the SHINE programme, which is delivered by SACRO, along with a number of kind of third sector partners. Um, they're not volunteers, they are paid people who, who are doing that, that's, that's what the funding goes for. But in terms of what you get from the volunteers in the third sector, I think one of the key points is these aren't people, these aren't agents of the state doing this. They're, they're someone other, they're these um, unconditional pillars of support that will provide support to people, you know, regardless of the, the ups and downs that they go through. So... Um, of all the categories of people you alluded to, they are providing support to um, women who are on remand um, and also women who are on commuter disposals as well as people um, coming out of um, custody from a sentence. They're not currently providing support to women on bail. I just want to make a little remark so that it's on the record. It's taken us an hour to get a fan <laughs> for this room. Now, whoever's listening to this, I don't know what you were doing while we were waiting for you to keep the fans in this building, but an hour to deliver one fan. That's your okay. test. Make it 30 minutes next time you get a round of applause. Thank you. Sorry about that, Sandra. That's On you go. <laughs> that's, quite all, that's quite all right, convener. Uh, I certainly don't feel that, that warm anyway. Yeah, I, sh I should have clarified the fact when I said volunteers. It's not, I mean, third sector, people call it volunteers, but obviously they are professionals in that field. Uh, and you mentioned there that uh, at the moment there were no mentoring for people who are on bail. Is that to be looked at in the future? I think so. As Cabinet Secretary said, we've just recently um, announced extension of the Reducing Reoffending Change Fund for a further two years, and that will allow a, a chance to look at this a, a bit closer. Um, in terms of how the actual mentoring projects have been developed, we have very much sort of allowed the, the lead organisation, in this case SACRA, along with their partners, to, to design their project. And the bail element of it is something that hasn't um, come out of it, of it so far. So I can't say absolutely it's going to be uh, looked at a bail, but... Um, I guess there's no reason why um, it might not develop in, in, in that way. That, that's fine just now, thank you. Thank you. Eileen, followed by John Finney. Sorry, is this a supplementary audit? Yes, go for it. Clarification on, on volunteers. In, um, in the Commission's report, they talked about the use of volunteers, including faith groups and or ex-offenders. Could you start out, are any ex-offenders involved in mentoring at the moment? Yes, there's an organisation called Positive Prisons um, you might be uh, familiar with, which, which actually uses ex-offenders in, in that way. They are involved in at least one of the, of the mentoring schemes around that. Um, I've also been in touch with other organisations that with the funding that we put out through the Reducing Reoffending Change Fund who are interested in developing that sort of peer mentoring that you're describing in, in that sort of way as well. So there is absolutely that, that element to this. Um, I guess one of the things we have to be keen on is, is I think we're absolutely clear that mentoring is a really really important part of it um, but for the people who are going to be the, the people mentored, the mentees, I guess there's a need to make sure there's a, a degree of coordination around that so they aren't flooded with lots of kind of requests for people to, to come along and, and be their mentor but um, to answer your question, the, the vision around people who have had that experience that the people they're now mentoring um, previously being part of it and that is the case. Thank you. It's Elaine, followed by John Finney, followed by John Pentland, followed by yourself again, Roddy. 
Elaine. Well, uh, if I could just return to the issue about the, the local prison, prisons for remand and short-term uh, sentence, sentence prisoners. Obviously, um, the three centres are not local to, to some communities uh, in Scotland, and that I appreciate that uh, some years ago, HMP Dumfries had a women's unit, and there were so few women in it, it just didn't work, and, and the women weren't able to be supported properly. But I'm just wondering, in terms of improving liaison with local communities, what thought has been given to those women who come from local communities, which are not particularly local to Greenock or Grampian or Edinburgh, and how that can be worked through, really, in terms of offering the same sort of service to those women? I think that's undoubtedly the challenge uh, we, we face, is to find new ways to, to reach out to the, the multiplicity of, of communities. I think the vehicle in which we would prefer to do that will be through the um, community planning partnerships, undoubtedly, as, as they emerge in the, the new roles with new responsibilities. And certainly uh, our strategic direction and our planning approach very much recognises the important role that the planning partnerships uh, have. Now, that's not to say that every single community uh, uh, has uh, citizens in, in our care, but I think that general approach uh, to make sure that those issues that we are aware of and that communities are dealing with are represented in the totality and in an integrated way, and certainly that's, that's our approach to affecting that in the future. I may know in some recent Galloway that one time might only be one or two women, but Obviously, those women need to have that sort of support. And I'm just wondering, how would it work in practice in terms of those women actually having the links with their local communities? And I think that's the journey we're on. Um, I, I can't sit here and say for every single community I can tell you how it's going to work in practice. I think our approach is to work through community planning partnerships to make sure that we can contribute to an integrated support mechanism that makes sure that those that come from communities and go back to them have the best possible support package on their way back to the community and certainly for that initial period that they're settling back in. In terms of the, the new model for community justice centres and so on, there's obviously the, the idea that there would be a national agency but working with local communities then again would that be a service you would e see, expect to see throughout all 32 local authorities or will that be more concentrated in certain areas and maybe people having to travel more or whatever? That most likely will be for others to comment on, but certainly from my perspective in running the Scottish Prison Service, I, I, I would certainly want uh, to be part of a more integrated approach that's informed by evidence and makes best practice available and known to all, all the partners. To anybody else? If they don't nominate themselves, well, you see, I just leave them be. But uh, <laughs> well, so I want to say, say Mr. Bruce, can more progress actually? What's what's going on in terms of developing that? In terms of the it. redesign of the community justice structures. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So one of the, com the commission's recommendation was to create a a national service. Um, that isn't a recommendation that, that we're pursuing. As you, the committee may be aware, we've had a number of consultations on the future of um, community justice in, in, in Scotland. The first consultation took. Um, the option of having the national service as um, envisaged by, by the Commission, along with the local model and enhancing CGAs. And none of those options provided kind of received universal support in the consultation. The model that we've, we've gone for, which we've just ended a consultation on that, is to um, for CGAs to um, be disestablished and for responsibility for community justice to go to community planning partnerships. And the idea behind that is, as the Commission saw, is this needs to be far more around criminal justice, social work. It needs to be around enhancing the contribution of health, housing, the full range of partners that, that make a contribution to allowing people to uh, you know, go on a journey for, around, around assisting from crime. What we will create is a new national body that will oversee um, that um, the extent to which that is happening. So whilst responsibility will, will be with the 32 community planning partnerships to deliver reducing re-offending, there will be a national body which will, will oversee that, will um, have greater visibility and transparency of the extent to which those outcomes are being achieved across the full range of partners. And importantly, in terms of where the Commission was coming from, it will have that leadership role. So one of the things that the Commission found lacking was that sort of senior sort of um, voice that speaks up for community justice and, and the full range of things, and, and that leadership role um, will be resided in the, the national body. 
In terms of funding, will that be completely down to the local authorities to decide how much funding is, is available? Or? Well, funding for um, criminal justice social work now is currently 100% funded through, um, through Scottish Government. So this is one of the, the things that are up for um, consultation just now. I think it's likely that that will remain. Um, to, inter to implement the sort of changes we require sort of primary legis legislation, um, I think it's likely that we will retain that funding and it will, will, will find its way down to, to the local authorities in, in that way. On, on this remoteness, which is very important, obviously, for Elaine's constituency and others in this room, um, how often do you use technology? My granddaughter keeps in touch with Granny Canada and Skype. She's been doing it since she could crawl. You know, it, it's very important that people in prison feel that they are not a number but are a person that's known to the social work in their area and there's somebody personal to. Do you use that when people can't or families can't make it up to visit, that they can use technology to keep in touch with their children and the, the family at large? I think there, there are two aspects to that, Kavina. I think the first is the development of video conferencing in terms of the workings of the justice system and how courts and prisons link, how prisons and legal representatives link and how prisons and um, social service providers link. So that's, that's, that's all in train and development. For the person in <coughs> prison? Indeed. Can they have, do they have access to So the second, the second strand is, is that personal access. Yes. Uh, that's currently not available. That's not that we, to be direct with you, not that we wouldn't want it to be provided. But I, I appreciate there are there are political and public sensitivities uh, uh, around uh, people in prison having having access to to Skype and other other sort of visual. But surely, visual media. you know, supervised talking to their children or their mother or whatever would be easy to do and would keep them in touch. For they can't always have family visits if you're in freeze coming up to Glasgow or whatever, yep. or Inverclyde. I think te technologically, I think you're spot on. It would be easy to do. Uh, it's not something currently that, that we are planning to provide on the basis that I think it would be something that we'd have to be well consulted on oh, uh, right. in order to check out the, the sensitivities and the risks that may be perceived. Oh, oh, a wee bit surprised at that. There we are, I see. Um, I mean, I can understand the sensitivities. My wee surprised it can't just be done operationally. It just seemed like a big deal. The family supervision that takes place just now, it's supervised when we went uh, to see it at court at the young offenders at Pullman. was supervised with the, the toddler with the, the girlfriend. So I didn't quite see why, if you can't make it, you can't just do that. So at least they feel they're speaking to their family. But there we go. Maybe you'll do it. Um, I'm not involved in this, by the way. There's no money in this for me. I'm not promoting it for any reason. Jo John Finney, followed by John Pentland. Yeah, thank you, Kavina. It's, it's a question for Mr. McConnell. Mr. McConnell, yeah, I don't know if you're cited in the Howard League's comments that were alluded to by my colleague Alison there. A quote from it, it says, two years on from the publication of the report of the Commission of Women Offenders, we are concerned the balance is still significantly tilted in favour of custody rather than community-based approaches to address women's offending behaviour. And I wonder the extent to which, if you like, the language of the Scottish Prison Service, I appreciate you're an enlightened individual, maybe. Uh, and if I can quote again from the letter we received from Ian Davidson, your Director of Strategy and Innovation, where he says, the normal operating capacity for Inverclyde of 300 includes four places for mother and baby unit and eight places in the community integration unit. Now, that doesn't... It, um, and then goes on to say, making the prison's mainstream capacity 288 in a combination of single and twin rooms. Now, I would have thought the entire population should, to some extent at least, be community integrated. I'm not wishing to play in words here, but that seems to be a comparable number to the unit, for instance, touching on what Elaine talked about, that was an Inverness prison for people at the end of their service, which was proving to be very successful. Can't recall the figures, but you know, 23, 24, and only two had re-offended, things like that. Is the challenge getting that change of culture within the Scottish Prison Service to reflect more the sort of disposals people are wanting to see and the level of community engagement? And it's really helpful that, that you've raised that, because I think what, what that helpfully does is actually draws out the, um, the risks or the limitations in trying to segment things too far. So I... I I take it as a, as a planning approach. The numbers have to add up to a particular number. But the journey we're on, and it's very clearly set out in our uh, strategic review, is that actually 
in terms of our care of people who pass into custody, we view that every single one is on a journey towards reintegration. So, again, whilst not wishing to dance in the head of a pin or, or play with language, the reality is that we will have 300, um, a capacity of 300 at Inverclyde, just taking Inverclyde as an example. But my, my view is every single one of my fellow citizens who will be residing there for a period of time are on a reintegration journey. So whether we segment it as eight or just view it as 300, I think it depends on, on how you want to view it. But my own view is every single person in custody is on a journey to reintegration. But, but that was my point. I don't doubt that's, that's your view, but if, mm. is it important that it's your staff's view as well? Oh, I, I'm, I'm in absolutely no doubt that um, the vast majority of staff who work for the Scottish Prison Service have a very similar view. I wouldn't, again, as I've said here on other issues, I wouldn't wish to pretend that everything is, is as I see it. It's not, and people will have different views, will have different values and beliefs. But from a, a being convinced point of view, I think the vast majority of the men and women that work for the Scottish Prison Service view things in that way. Up on the point that the convener raised about um, the perhaps use of technology to uh, in, ensure that there's contact with uh, um, families. Um, now, I, I think you were wrongly pilloried before for a view you took in relation to mobile phones, which I personally fully supported, which was, as I understood, entirely about that. One of the frustrations we hear about technology in prisons is the building design. Is this building as designed to accommodate this number of people capable of, for instance, moving towards that? Because I understand the, how staff intensive it would be to have 300 folk all speaking with their kids and granny once a week, let alone every day. So I, I, are the, the, the frustrations that there were with the, the structure of previous designs, have they been acknowledged and adapted anywhere, or is it more of the same but just new? Again, one of the fantastic opportunities we've had, and we've been supported in taking this approach, is to design uh, Inverclyde and the new unit Edinburgh in particular exclusively for the custody of and care of women. And in answering directly your question, we have future-proofed, anticipated developing policy, emerging technologies, as far as that's possible, within reason. So in terms of the, the communication issue, Inverclyde and the new Edinburgh unit are being constructed with that capacity already inherent in the design. And if the success of, of the, the various things that the Cabinet Secretary and, and Mr Bruce have talked about, the community rather than the custodial version, is there the wherewithal to mothball these places for women or utilise them for male prisoners? I've not, I don't think I've quite understood your question, Mr Fay. Well, everyone's goal is to reduce the number of people in prison, mm -hmm. not least the number of women in, in prison. Mm -hmm. Can the building as designed be used for other purposes if we do reduce the number of women who are referred to you? Yeah. The, 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 the design of uh, Inverclyde and the Edinburgh unit uh, is scalable in the sense that um, you know, it's not one massive space. It is it's scalable. So, yes, to a point... But in some ways, uh, if, if we get to that point where we have um, insufficient uh, women in custody to justify the operation of the facility in the way that it's currently designed, then I think that will require the rethinking of the approach. There will become a point, if we are ultimately utopianly successful, that we have single figures or very small numbers of women or anybody in custody, then I think a whole new approach, a whole new paradigm will have to be developed. But that in itself would be a fantastic challenge to take on. Well, let's hope we get there, but that could be... The, the whole estate, the, the prison estate has been seen as a whole, not just everything's going to be right for women prisoners. Um, oh, no, and, and again, um, it's, although we're here talking about women, there is tremendous work uh, going on with young people at Parliament too. And what we're trying to do as an organisation and share with other justice organisation delivery partners is as we learn the lessons uh, through our study of improving services for women and for young people, then that translates, scales up and rolls out across the whole estate that, so that all of those in custody benefit. Thank you. Is, is this a supplementary? Yes, please. If I, I will Come find on. out. Thank you very much, Amanda. No, you talk about uh, Edinburgh and other facilities, but I didn't hear you talking about HMF, 
HMP champion and what kind of uh, difference it's making to rehabilitation and integration of offenders and as well on the design of the prison. If you can give a few words about that. Well, because Grampian is a, is, is a unique uh, facility in terms of it's, it's Scotland's first, what's been described as a community-facing uh, uh, prison. Uh, so, of course, Grampian by design will hold women, men, and, of course, uh, young, young males too. Uh, so that's, that's a new concept, and I think we're on a journey to discovering how best to make that work, not just from operationally running it from the Scottish Prison Service's perspective, but running it in a joined-up way with the communities of, of the northeast of, of Scotland. And that's not something that's immediately apparent. I think we're going to have to work on that for months and years ahead to really make that community integration work for those that are going to live for a time at Grampian. Too early to get some uh, feedback already from uh, I, 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 I think, in, in truth, it is rather early. We're, we're talking here months after the launch. Uh, and I think both those who uh, run community services and we who run the custodial service have to continue with our absolute commitment to keep exploring and working on integrating the service approach in the months and years ahead and not just settle for anything that appears to work at a given time. Yeah, I would love you to come back to the committee when, when you have start to have some data okay. of what happened well, in update. Uh, the committee to decide whether or not... I was going to ask you whether, perhaps it's for the committee, or whether for yourself, Mr McConnell, whether it would be useful for the committee to see the design of... You keep talking about the design of Corton Vale. I don't know what it looks like. Um, I presume the design is complete... Or am I, is my presumption along it's simply now contract awards and so on? No, the, 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 the design is, in, in effect, we're, we're at the, the proof of design stage. So right. where, where we are now, we've, uh, we've employed um, uh, value specialists who are working with us to make sure that in terms of the design, the construction approach, and the materials that are being proposed to be used as a totality present the best value uh, for the investment from the public purse. I think we're interested in the design layout. I think yeah. that's what we would be looking at when you're saying that it's it's multifunctional mm. for it's serious uh, and at risk to the community. An issue raised by Alice at the beginning and also this idea yeah. of, if I may use it, a lighter touch. I don't mean that, that it's frivolous, but you know, I'm trying to um, improve and help people to uh, you know, come, not come back and re-offend and to deal with all the multi-issues that we all know about. Would it be useful for what you have for, and I'm certainly committed to decide to see this design there, what do you, do you think? So you're all looking at me as if I'm on another planet. If, if I could. I could oh. be, yes. So it would be useful for us to have that and maybe have a, a briefing from someone, uh, you know, yes. a, a, an informal briefing, just looking at the design layout and explain to us how it will, how it will operate. If, I mean, if I could offer a view, convener, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit nerdy about these things, obviously a bit of an anorak, but... Um, Nobody I, refuted I'm, that. That was terrible. They all just sat there accepting it. But just to go I mean, ahead, I'm, I'm absolutely convinced and excited and, I think, proud that in Scotland we are on the journey to um, bringing into operation something that will be a class leader in Europe. I'm absolutely convinced of that. And not just from a design perspective, important though that is, from an integrated service delivery right, okay. point of view. But but it would be useful for us to see that. So I leave that in your hands yeah. just now and the clerks okay. will write and I think we'd be quite interested in seeing how this word design layout and everything would, would yeah. operate for very happy to for do. the for the women prisoners. Thank you very much. Um John Pentland followed by Roderick back to Alison after that. John uh, thank you convener uh, Mr McConnell uh, the Higher League Scotland asked the Cabinet Secretary for Justice whether the proposals for HMF and for Clyde, when in keeping with the Commission's overall aspirations. And the Cabinet Secretary replied that decisions relating to the size and design were an operational matter uh, for the Scottish Prison Service. So my question then would be, was the design of Inverclyde based on budget? Because I seem to remember, uh, Mr McConnell, you saying that you would have no difficulty in maintaining standards and delivering improvements on a reduced budget. And uh, yet, this looks to me like a cost-saving measure rather than one designed to meet the recommendations uh, of the Commission. 
So could you maybe advise the, the committee how much more it would have cost if SPS were to provide a completely separate local and uh, national facilities? And will the temptation not always remain there to retort to, to a more shared functions and increase in integration, in integration, you know, when there is budgetary constraints adding to the pressure? And are we not in danger? Or this will lead eventually to a recreation of Cotton Vale at Inverclyde? Yeah. I mean, where, where we're at with uh, Inverclyde and the Inver unit, in, in my opinion, is not just within the spirit of what Dame Eilish uh, recommended, but I think, in actuality, it follows it to the letter, and I'll, I'll explain why. I, I'm very aware that what Dame Eilish uh, recommended was a focus on the different stages and different needs of women who pass in and out of custody. And Dame Eilish quite rightly uh, referred to the scale of the living environment, and I think what she meant then was its context in relation to the communities that women come from and go back to. From the experience that we have uh, in operating successfully custodial facilities, it's SPS's judgment, my judgment, that what we've proposed is, is the best solution to meeting the recommendations that Dame Eilish made, both in terms of uh, the spirit and the letter of her recommendations. And in particular, in relation to Inverclyde, the design and the approach, the service provision approach that we have in mind uh, for Inverclyde will absolutely address, beyond anything currently we've been able to provide, those very issues that Dame Eilish has identified. So in, in terms of, are we cutting corners? Could we have delivered more with more money? Probably. In terms of more with more money, are we cutting corners? No, we are not. Do we need more money to make the proposed Inverclyde more successful? Absolutely not. This is something that's designed to meet the challenge that it's going to face. And I'm absolutely convinced you could accuse me of being overly effusive, but I've got 30 years in the business, and this is by far the best constructed, best resourced, best informed approach to the development of a new facility that I have ever encountered, both in terms of its internal contribution, but the contribution from the community and other specialists alike. So my response to you is, this is the best fit for the challenge that we are likely to face in the coming years. But that being said then, Mr McConnell, but then in response to a question asked by uh, Mr Finney, you answered that somewhere down the line we're going to have to scale back a bit on the facilities that you are now going to spend £75 million on. So, you know, the question is, have we got it right? I think if I understood Mr Finney... Have we got it right? I think if I understood Mr Finney correctly, um, in, in the future world, uh, if, as a country, uh, we are successful in uh, having a, a substantially lower crime society, which in itself then generates fewer people for custody, then, of course, we will have to uh, take a, a fresh approach, not just, I suppose, at Inverclyde, but nationally across uh, a custodial estate that probably has more spaces in it than the people who are sent to us by the courts. I would say what a fantastic cultural and national opportunity that would be, and I would welcome it if that came round. Just one further question, eh, convener. Uh, I'm not too sure if I picked Mr Bruce up right, but just on that very point about how the SPS believe that this is a design uh, which will help women offenders, I'm not too sure, Mr Bruce, if you said there were other uh, stakeholders has actually put an input in supporting that. Is it at all possible for us to get the, uh, the written evidence on that, or do you have information that you could maybe share with the committee? So stakeholders input that, into yeah. the design of... Yeah. 
in the we're design and, 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 and what has been proposed by SPS is, you know, the, the way forward for women offenders. Because I have a slight doubt that perhaps that what has been led here is, is through budget rather than, you know, rather than what, what we're trying to do to help women offenders. Right. And you said you had further information uh, that might be able to back up the support for SPS design. I'm not sure I answered that question. I think I was referring to the consultation around community justice redesign yeah. as a whole. Yeah. So the whole okay. structure. Which Can I say to be possible is, I mean, all our, all our evidence is in public. And I think if anyone wants to challenge your question, which was not, in fact, what you'd answered, which was about uh, the, the community justice, they will do, as you and I know. They will email us and write, and we welcome that. So I think we can get comments from outside if they feel that, you know, as agencies, voluntary agencies and so on, there's something amiss. Yes, of course, yes. And Cabinet Secretary, do you believe then that the SPS is embarking on the, the, the way forward to, to help and support women offenders? Yes, I'm delighted that the uh, ongoing work, as I have always been at the efforts of SPS, and I think the, uh, the Angelini Commission gives a direction and a template that we're seeking to, to work to, but uh, uh, I'm delighted at the past and current efforts. I'm going to take... Is that you all right, John, now? Thank okay. you. Roddy, you next. And then Alison to conclude. I think we'll conclude at that. Okay. I shouldn't have said that, because somebody else will put the name on the list. Roddy. OK. Um, Mr McConnell, uh, I'd perhaps you could give us an, an update on where we are with voluntary through care. And also, one of the issues in the uh, Commission's report, paragraph 74, was the uh, issue raised as the lack of suitable accommodation, especially on release from prison. And again, if there's... Any information you can provide on that, that would be helpful. In, in a sense, it's out of my bailiwick, uh, the, the, the provision of, of services in, in the community. It's, it's well understood the challenge that people leaving custody face, and, and Andy Bruce touched on it, particularly in terms of uh, housing. I think a direction we can uh, undoubtedly head in in future, in terms of the discussion, with our uh, improving relationships with community planning partnerships is to talk through as, as partner organisations uh, how we can best respond to those challenges. And I think some of the, the weaknesses of the past have been in around silo organisations trying to think through their own part. I think the approach through CPPs undoubtedly will, will allow us to problem solve in a more integrated way. Is there anything... Mr. Bruce wanted to ask. Yeah. It's an absolute priority for us. I mean, I think the committee is aware that the Cabinet Secretary chairs a ministerial group on offender reintegration, which is looking at exactly these sorts of things. And um, sort of colleagues are, with responsibility for housing, health, employability have, have, have looked in around that. And, and housing has been the focus of, of one of those meetings. One of the um, innovations that has come out of that is a housing trial at HMP Perth, which is looking at both trying to stop people losing their tenancy upon coming in to custody so that they don't become homeless, and then equally looking to bring some housing expertise within um, the prison as well to work not just on behalf of the local authority for which that person works, but the full range of local authorities to which um, the people living in Perth will be returning to, to to make sure that there is a far more timely um, move into sustainable um, accommodation upon um, upon leaving Perth. So that's using the kind of Scottish Government's improvement um, approach where you're testing out small bits of change prior to, to looking at um, running out further wide. So there's a sort of tangible, um, I suppose, description there of what we're trying to do to, to improve that kind of housing pathway. Okay, thank you. I think I'm right. Project 218 has been doing that for some time when we visited some time ago, that that was the key thing, was speaking to Glasgow City Council, that people did not lose their tendency, which we were quite shocked to find out that it compounded the problems uh, and ensured the tendency continued uh, so they walked back into where they've been before when they were released. Maybe that's maybe not always the best environment, but if it were a suitable environment to go back into. Yeah. So I'm quite um, pleased to hear that that's being looked at elsewhere. And of course, the other development there, which you know we're very proud of, is, is the development of women's services uh, across Scotland. So, you know, two on eight started off that. We've maintained the funding for that, and then on the back of the, the commission, there's been investment in in women's um, services uh, across Scotland as well. Some of which on the, the centre model, where in the urban centres you're a bricks and mortar facility where the services are there in one place wrapped around the women, but equally where that's not. Um, appropriate for women's more rural occasions is actually more outreach type services where the same aspiration that you're you bringing the full package together but, but, but taking it to, to the people rather than expecting them to come to, to a single site. 
Thank you. And Alison, I'll let you conclude. Thank you, Thank you very much. It's been an, an interesting session. Um, return to where, we, where I started, basically, and that the Commission's report brought forward a number of interlocking and interdependent recommendations. And I'm really, um, I'm still concerned that we're getting out of step now with things. So something is moving forward um, in, in a good way, I think. Um, so the, the redevelopment of the prison um, is moving forward. What's not coming along at the same speed is the community justice centres, as far as I can see. Um, and I'm very concerned. I mean, the, the, the Cabinet Secretary has used the phrase 218 light on, on more than one occasion when we've been discussing this. Um, and I know that the Tomorrow's Women facility um, has only got funding for 18 months. It doesn't have any residential facility. So none of the, the proposals that are coming forward across Scotland actually replicate what was going on, the good practice in 218. So no residential facilities there. And I suppose I'd like to ask the Cabinet Secretary for his commitment and leadership on this. Um, will he fight for the resources um, to, to be able to say, give us the same assurance that he's not cutting corners that Mr McConnell has given us on the prison's development, uh, on the justice centres? Yes, I, I can give you that. Budgets are tight across all walks of life, personal, private, public sector, uh, but we are putting in what we can, which we feel is appropriate. The concept of 218 Light, and 218 is an outstanding project, but it was accepted and discussed with them that not every uh, centre requires to have accommodation. It can be dealt with in terms of individuals coming in. We also require to take onto and into account the nature and geography of Scotland. That is why the 218 uh, sort of replication, albeit without the uh, accommodation, uh, has gone into uh, Dundee, Edinburgh, etc. Uh, in other areas where there's sparser geography, we've had to deal with it in a different way. But it's to make sure that we get the best of 218, which was to try and work out what the problem or problems in many instances were, to make sure that we provide that support. You do have to have an analysis and investigations carried about those with particular skills and expertise, such as uh, those with psychiatric qualifications. Equally, it's quite clear that thereafter a lot of it may be mentoring support. Uh, equally, what we're also clear here is that what is also going to work and make it maintainable and sustainable in the future is making sure we bring together outside agencies. That's why we are keeping it local, why we are building upon community planning partnerships. It cannot all be done by the justice sector it, or law enforcement. It has to have health, housing, employment, all of these other agencies have to be round the table. So I believe that we're building on the outstanding work of 218. We're making sure that the facilities, whether in Edinburgh and others I've visited in Glasgow, uh, deliver that and recognise the geography and the geographical difficulties in Scotland. I'm sorry, she just wasn't looking very happy, but well, can I have two short questions I'm, then, I'm not, Don't cut you well, short. I'll, I'll, I'll leave that there, but I, I would just stress that none of them replicate 218, and it's hard to believe that Dundee and Edinburgh don't, ha, wouldn't benefit from a, a similar service. But um, more worryingly, I think, is the, um, the hub-and-spoke development in the prisons, which we've got. And I would want to seek assurances that we wouldn't end up with a two-tier service. Um, so we've got um, the people in the West uh, who are in, in Reclyde and have access to all of the facilities there and the people in the North and the East who can only access the services sometime. I recently visited HMP Grampian and the women, while happy with their new um, accommodation, were concerned that they didn't have access to the programmes and the, the um, facilities that um, they had already had um, when they were in Quantum Vale. Um, and that they will have to go back to Inverclyde or to Conton Vale to access those programmes. So I'm a bit concerned about that and about how that actually helps proper integration. And I wonder if Mr McConnell could uh, speak about that. Yeah. I'm very happy to, to respond to that. And again, you, you're absolutely uh, right uh, to be concerned about that. And in, in some ways, I'll answer the question in two parts. If you could imagine the situation where we had lots of small facilities, the geometric factoring up of those very difficulties that you're talking about. That's why, you know, in response to Mr Pentland, I, I think the solution we've arrived at is, on a scale basis, the best solution for everyone concerned. In terms of the service delivery, particularly in terms of programmes, it's actually really difficult to get the, um, the number of people together who have the skills and the background and the qualifications to deliver those programmes 
in the first place. And of course, we have an ongoing programme of recruitment and training and, and qualification. Uh, so certainly for the foreseeable future, it's highly likely that for very specialist programmes, that Inverclyde will be the specialist centre for delivering them. And whilst I, I accept it, absolutely that there is a, a detriment uh, to women in terms of their closeness to the community if they need access to those programmes, I'd much rather um, persuade them of the acceptability of the detriment from the, uh, as opposed to the, or counterbalanced by the positiveness that will come, will come in getting access to a highly specialised, well-delivered uh, programme for their particular needs. And I accept it's not an ideal situation. I'd, I'd prefer to have all the specialist resources everywhere around the country, but that's not practical to do that. Okay, finally, convener, you mentioned IT. Um, the Commission's report um, spoke about fostering self-responsibility uh, amongst, amongst prisoners, and I'm interested in your view of the potential for modern technology to do that. When we visited um, uh, Adiwell, um, and I know that in Kilmarnock also they use the self-service IT kiosks, and we'll all remember that Brigadier Hugh Monroe was praised that as a way forward. Um, has that been taken forward in the new prison? We are, we, are, we are certainly um, planning to introduce self-service type technology. I don't think at this stage we've absolutely settled on what that will be. But if I could just share with you, and perhaps it's, it's something to discuss further in due course, we, we know and all the evidence uh, supports this uh, view, particularly from, from ac academic and experiential uh, research, that what makes the difference for our fellow citizens who pass through custody in terms of their own perception of self-esteem and their willingness, preparedness to change, is the quality of relationship that exists between them and the, the, the staff who are working in the prison on their behalf. And I think we have to be careful in not using technology as an alternative to that. We currently have an appropriately and well-resourced Scottish Prison Service. I think as a country we should be proud of that and we need to make sure that through the people that work in the service we, we provide the best opportunity for those high quality relationships to have an impact. So I think there's a balance in that approach that has to be taken. I think we should share that. You were suggesting for a minute we have you know, robots or whatever supplanting people and the importance of I think that's what we're getting at for the remoter areas, is keeping some kind of personal relationship going. And I thank you very much for your evidence. I know the Cabinet Secretary is staying for the next item, so I'll suspend for a couple of minutes to allow the witnesses to leave. Thank you. March back we go. Uh, next item, uh, item two, if I have your attention, people. Um, uh, item two is consideration of one affirmative instrument, the draft Scottish Legal Complaints Commission Modification of Duties and Powers Regulations 2014. This instrument amends and adds to the duties and powers of the Scottish Legal Aid Complaints Commission with the aim of improving the complaints process 
And Cabinet Secretary, uh, you're still here, of course, and we have now Denise Swanson, Head of Access to Justice Unit, and Alistair Smith from the Legal Directorate. Welcome to the two new witnesses. The Cabinet Secretary will give evidence in advance of the debate and instrument. I understand, Cabinet Secretary, you wish to make a brief opening statement. Uh, thank you, Convener. I'm happy to be here today to assist the Committee in its consideration of the Scottish Legal Complaints Commission Modification of Duties and Powers Regulations 2014. The Law Society of Scotland and the Scottish Legal Complaints Commission had previously contacted the Minister for Community Safety and Legal Services and the Justice Committee in order to raise concerns about certain practical aspects of the Legal Profession and Legal Aid Scotland Act 2007. Both the Society and the Commission agreed to form a working group with other stakeholders, the aim of which was to suggest changes to the legislation that would improve the complaints process, benefiting both the public and the profession. The group consisted of the Law Society, the Scottish Legal Complaints Commission, the Faculty of Advocates, the Association of Commercial Attorneys, the Legal Defence Union, the Scottish Solicitors Discipline Tribunal, Citizens Advice Scotland, which, and the Centre for Professional Legal Studies at Strathclyde University Law School. These amending regulations are a direct result of the findings of this working group. They will significantly assist in making the legislation a more effective framework for dealing with legal complaints in Scotland. This is in keeping with the Scottish Government's national outcome that our public services are high quality, continually improving, efficient and responsive to local people's needs. The regulations rearrange the order in which the SLCC considers the various aspects of a complaint to improve efficiency and better reflect current practice. They give the LCC the power to discontinue and reinstate services complaints and they give legal practitioners the right to complain about the handling of a complaint by a professional body. They also require the SLCC to set up an independent panel which can advise it on consumer and equality issues. And I hope this is useful to the committee and I'm happy to take any questions. Well, it all just seems like common sense to me, this, but that's maybe to Alice, um, uh, Margaret, sorry. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that opening statement. Can I ask to, to what extent the uh, Scottish Government monitors the operation of the, the Commission? Um, the um, SLCC puts forward an annual report that's laid in Parliament uh, every year. It's a non-departmental public body um, which uh, my unit has sponsorship responsibility for and we work closely with the SLCC um, and we also work with them on their um, consultation on their budget proposals. So um, it's an unusual non-departmental departmental public body in that it is not funded by the Scottish Government, it is funded by a levy on the profession. Um, so there is a certain amount of accountability to the profession on the way that the, the, the Commission operates, but we work very closely with them in, um, you know, in, in, in improvements and efficiency in their operations. Yes, um, I, I'm aware that ministers appoint members of the board, but given that these changes, which are all very sensible and uh, should improve the, the commission and the complaint system, have, coming f have come from stakeholders, I wonder, given it was 2008 that um, the, the commission came into being, is it not now time for some post-legislative scrutiny on how it's operating and a more operating and a more in-depth look? at um, its performance and how it could perhaps be improved? Well, I'm happy to consider any suggestions that uh, the member or indeed the committee may have, but it does seem to me that we've got the appropriate balance, as Denise was saying. Uh, it is a non-departmental public body. We do uh, appoint the commission. There is a level of scrutiny there, but I think we have to have trust and faith in those who are appointed, and we do. Equally, I think it's quite clear, given the levy, which is unusual, if not necessarily unique, that ensures that there's a great deal of scrutiny from bodies that also also are represented and represent individual members. So I'm happy to take on any board, but it does seem to me that actually the Commission, together with those stakeholders, have been working reasonably well. They've recognised that there have been challenges and difficulties. They've got themselves together. They've worked out what changes need to be made, and we're here as the administration to support them, but we're open to suggestions. I suppose the point being, um, Cabinet Secretary, I understand it's a, a levy from the stakeholders, people who may be the subject of the complaints. So I suppose what I'm um, suggesting is ensuring more independent scrutiny is there. 
Well, again, I'm, I'm open to suggestions as to what level of scrutiny you want. I've had no suggestions that the organisation is not working you know, reasonably well and smoothly. Uh, clearly, as in any NDP, the government has oversight and responsibility, but it does seem to me uh, that uh, uh, some tweaks and challenges have been met, they're being faced, they're discussing and engaging with the stakeholders and clearly my colleague, uh, my deputy and myself meet regularly, whether it's with the faculty or the Law Society of Scotland. Uh, but unless there's any suggestions of any malfeasance or other matters, I don't see why the government would necessarily wish to intervene in a body that appears to be liaising well, uh, operating uh, reasonably smoothly, but we're always open to suggestions. I suppose, that the Cabinet Secretary, it's just the, um, the number of proposals, in, which are all very good in this um, legislative consent motion, I think would be good for um, wider debate and for parliamentary scrutiny. It's something that we are pretty notoriously bad for in the Scottish Parliament, actually, in doing post-legislative scrutiny. That would be a matter for or the, the, the committee or indeed perhaps even for opposition parties and uh, opposition days. It seems to me that one of the reasons there's so many uh, aspects been referred to is a very complicated field, but I think I welcome the fact that they've discussed and taken on board not simply those who would normally be expected to be uh, represented there in terms of the Law Society and indeed the Faculty of Advocates, taking on board citizens' advice and which, given their interaction with the members of the public, but I think that's a matter for Parliament rather than necessarily government. Can I, I don't want to give evidence, but can I say, am I not right, historically it was the Law Society that had a, a, an arm of it that used to deal with complaints, and I don't think that was satisfactory, <coughs> and that now uh, that moving to the, the Scottish Law Complaints Commission, <coughs> and would, you, would the Cabinet Secretary agree with me? Because I, I take the view that an independent advisory panel will be very important, because it will be doing that, it will be looking... Uh, to see how it's operating. Well, the whole basis of the establishment of the SCLCC was public concern, yes. transmitted across political parties, as you've correctly said, uh, convener, that these aspects could not and should not be dealt with by uh, those professional bodies uh, regulating themselves. But I don't know if Denise... <coughs> yes. It, it, it may be helpful to note that in the past uh, two to three years, the SLCC has reported an improvement in the um, efficiency of its... Um, its handling of complaints, there was a bit of a backlog, that has now been resolved, that the, it has been able to reduce the levy in this, um, the, the, this budget, uh, the budget proposals that were recently consulted upon, so that it, it, it is reporting on um, improvements in process and the times in which it is taking to uh, process complaints. Enforcement of recommendations that that's working well. Yes, yeah, so uh, the, the 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 number of um, cases taken to court um, in terms of enforcement um, is re is reducing. Yeah. Brody. Just uh, wanted to make a, a brief point, but perhaps I should just refer to my register of interest, member of the Faculty of Advocates. It seems to me that the uh, putting on statute the independent advisory panel is a way forward, and I'm pleased to note that it's going to include representatives from consumer inequalities organisations, so that, I think, ought to make a substantial improvement in, in, uh, in the way the, the Commission functions, if it takes on board the comments of that panel. Yeah, can, can I say I welcome the flexibility that's built in. In fact, I'm quite surprised it's taken this while to get this flexibility, because some, I said it looks like common sense to me, uh, and, you know, it's taken a wee while uh, ability to revisit eligibility questions, rearranging the order of consideration, the headings that are under it, uh, powers to discontinue and reinstate service. It all seems to me something that, in terms of management of cases, was something that should have been there from the start. So I very much welcome it. But what I'd like to ask is, you sent consultation packs to a range of people. Were they all happy with this? Or were there any who, any of their consultative list, <coughs> including particularly the consumer organisations, CAB and which, and the OFT, were they content with these amendments being made um, to the existing practices? Yes, well, they were part of the, um, of the, 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 the group that... Um, that worked together on the proposals um, that were put forward. And, and the, the kind of remit of this group was to agree 
what elements of improvements could be uh, delivered through practice change, which required primary legislation, which required um, uh, subordinate legislation. Um, and so the, the group was able to come to an agreement on that position. I think the one outstanding um, issue is on the matter of appeals having to go to the court of session, but that is something that would require primary legislative change, so it's been accepted by that group that that, that, that position um, and that, that element of the process must remain as is at the moment. But the rest of their proposed amendments have got across yes. the spectrum yes. uh, agreement. Yes. That's fine. I don't see any more questions, so... I now move on. That's the um, evidence session. I now move on to item three, which is a formal debate on the motion to approve the instrument. Consider and invite the Cabinet Secretary to move motion S4M 10634. The Justice Committee recommends the draft Scottish Legal Complaints Commission Modification of Duties and Powers Regulation 2014 be approved. Formally moved. Do any members wish to speak in the debate? I take it not. Um, the question is that motion S4M 10634 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you very much. Um, that's uh, concluded, but as members are aware, I'm required to report, we are required to report on all affirmative instruments. Are you content, therefore, to de delegate authority to me to sign off this report? Yeah. Thank you very much. Right, that concludes that item. Thank you very much. Item four, uh, subordinate legislation, is consideration of one negative instrument, the right to information, suspects and accused persons, Scotland Regulations 2014, SSI 2014 159. This aims to satisfy the requirements of a recent EU directive on the right to information and in criminal proceedings by specifying that every suspect in police custody receives a letter of rights. The DPLR committee has drawn the attention of the Parliament to the instrument because the 28-day rule has not been complied with. However, it has accepted the Scottish Government's reasons for this. Also draws our attention to the terms of Regulation 3.2 regarding the time, li for the time limit for the provision of information. Are we happy to endorse the DPLR committee's conclusion? I knew I, was, I could see it in the corner of my eye, bracing yourself at the starting blocks. Get the Commonwealth Games in it. Right. <laughs> Alison. Thank you. Um, I just wanted John. to uh, comment that it makes no reference to the letter of rights being um, provided in a, an appropriate language uh, for the person, and I wonder whether it ought to refer to that. Yeah, well, it does. <laughs> John. Forget the one. An amendment that would come forward at a future stage, but in relation to the consultation and, and on page four, convener. Um, my former colleagues in Police Scotland, uh, they've indicated they already endeavour to ensure all suspects understand their rights and that in providing both verbally and writing would result in a disproportionate time, resource and allocations. Um, I think that's disappointing um, and, and indeed a, a conflict of terms. Um, and I'm perhaps in part reassured that there's further work required and that's mentioned in page, page five. But the reason it's terribly important it is read is because of the, the levels of uh, literacy um, that exists. So I, I think it's important to record that. And uh, I hope that uh, Police Scotland will realise, if they're endeavouring to assure all, aspect, all suspects understand their rights, that they'll see that there's a, a burning need for them to be read their rights. I'm just being minded by uh, officials here that the, in terms of the Criminal Justice Bill, which will come back to, she can put that amendment in, at um, section 5, subsection 3, the person must be provided as soon as reasonably practical with such information available in writing as is necessary to satisfy. It's actually also my experience that if you didn't do that, there would be a challenge uh, to the, what had happened in the proceedings. And in, in certainly, in, you'll know from your experience in process just now, if you, have, if you don't understand what's been asked of you in a police station, you can challenge the rest of the process and it can be actually set aside. Uh, but I think you're quite right to raise that, and uh, we can deal with that as stage two. You've raised it on the record now. Elaine, you're waving your pencil. That yeah. means something. Yeah, I, was it but not I've got, before you wave oh, your pencel, Alison, you've no, done no, your John. No. If any, you're in, you yes. may speak. That was, that was, <laughs> <laughs> was it not a recommendation in, in our stage one report that it should be in both? I there we are. Definitely think we ought there to, we are. to go back to it. And but good to raise it again. So there we are. And so we otherwise... We are happy. Your body language is so telling, you see. You hardly need to raise your voice. Happy to endorse the DPLR's com committee conclusions, are we? Yes. Right. Are you content to make no recommendation in relation to this instrument, apart from what we've now said on the record? Yes. 
Item 5, Scotland's National Action Plan for Human Rights. A rapporteur to the SNAP plan uh, process is John Finney. And John, you recently met Professor Alan Miller, Miller uh, Chair of the panel. I would ask John, please, if you could report back to the committee on the issues raised at that meeting. Yeah, thank, thank you, you. Convener. Yes, I, I met on the 18th of June, and I'm grateful to Neil the Clark for coming along and bringing pen and paper with him, which was very helpful. Um, certainly, it's the position... Did you use pen and paper? Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. No. It's, right. uh, it certainly was the, the, the view of Professor Alan Miller, the, the chair of SNAP, that he welcomed the, the engagement with the, the Justice Committee. Um, and he was aware that I would be reporting back in, in uh, August. Uh, as regards timeframes for things, um, the, the SNAP, as it's called, SNAP Leadership Panel will meet on the 7th of October and will consider a draft annual report. And uh, uh, it was agreed that I would meet with Professor Miller shortly after that. Um, with the report uh, likely to be published at the end of October. Um, Professor Miller advised there would be a suite of activities in the lead-up to the 10th of December, which is International Human Rights Day, including the Committee's Human Rights Debate that uh, has been agreed. Um, and it was noted in, in advance of that debate the Committee may find it uh, an informal briefing from SHRC on the international treaty obligations to be helpful, and there may be indeed merit in inviting uh, the subcommittee and other committees along to such a briefing. Um, Professor Miller provided an outline on the Action Plan 5. Uh, uh, action Plan, there's five action groups measuring the outcomes from public bodies and putting in plans for implementation. Uh, there's good progress being made, uh, and th there is no doubt that Scotland's position is viewed very favourably internationally. Um, and is ahead of the pack in respect of uh, human rights. Uh, in concluding, a few points. The, the discussions around existing areas of work with the committee and the subcommittee, we wish to consider incorporating human rights into existing work, and the examples suggested were stop and search, arming officers, women offenders, um, and I think uh, indirectly we're constantly relating to them. Indeed, the previous article uh, item was clearly about that. Uh, another suggestion was a, a possible time bar on the issues in the damage bill in respect of historic child abuse and consideration of the proposed Apologies Scotland Bill uh, should the bill be referred to the Justice Committee. Um, Professor Miller noted Police Scotland had made a high-level commitment to SNAP and is putting together a reference group on stop and search, which is very positive, and SNAP is involved in responding to that. Professor Miller indicated it would be helpful to receive feedback from the parliamentary committees on the effectiveness of submissions to uh, inquiries and bills. And it was agreed that, and uh, this has already happened, to informally advise the clerks to equal opportunities to the committee of the SNAP process and the relevant timescales to help inform any follow-up work uh, it has on the Gypsy Travellers uh, inquiries. And that's it. Um, I think the... I think the offer um, of an informal briefing, quite useful these. Um, do you feel the committee wants to have an informal briefing from Professor Millie Miller prior to the debate? And I was just asking when that might be. And the debate might be November, though the, the Business Bureau hasn't settled anything yet. Would you like to have an informal briefing on all issues by prior to our debate? I think it would be quite useful. Yep. Anything else? That's it. Thank you very much. Our next meeting is 12th of August when we hold two roundtable evidence sessions, first on brain injury and the criminal justice system, and the second on serious organised crime within the environmental sector. Thank you very much. Thank you.